Are you ready to study the Word of God, yes or no? It is going to be a good morning. You're going to be so encouraged today as we're in the series Soul Relief, where uh, a lot of you are carrying around just um, uh, turmoil in your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. And and, um, we really believe, in fact, the Bible says, not not just we believe, but but, um, as a Christian, you should believe too, that you're you're meant to live a life of joy. You're meant to live a life of peace, of hope, that you're actually, and I know this is, a lot of people don't think this about Christians, but... We're actually called to live a life that we thoroughly enjoy. Jesus said, I come to give you life and life to the full. Like, I want you to enjoy life. And yet we're carrying around all of these emotions, the, the, the turmoil inside of us that keeps us from really enjoying life. And uh, the last couple of weeks, I, I, I've kind of uh, uh, taught on a couple of things that I, I, I didn't expect to, to teach about, but the Lord just uh, told me to speak on those things. And, and this week, though, there's something that I, that I, I knew that the Lord was calling me to, to speak on uh, as I was preparing for this sermon series. And the, and the word of the day, the topic of the day is affirmation. Affirmation is the word of the day. That, that a lot of people struggle, and a lot of people in this room watching online right now, you struggle with affirmation in your life. That, that, that your lack of affirmation, your lack of affirmation is controlling how you view your life. It's controlling the joy that you have or the peace that you have or the hope that you have or just, just enjoying every, uh, every day of your life. It's, it's just restricting your enjoyment of life because you don't feel the affirmation. And so you go out and you search for it. You search for affirmation and we see this. In fact, uh, you know, Jennifer and I have been off social media now for quite some time, and it's wonderful. But I do remember back, I do remember back when, uh, when we were looking at social media that so many people just posting selfies and like taking photo shoots every day of the week and posting the pictures of themselves and they're striking poses and they're flexing and wh- whatever. And, and I want to I tell you, on the, on the inside of me, I, I was always grieved at that. And so if it's you, I don't know if you're doing it or not, so I can talk freely because I don't know. I just don't know. But, but on the inside of that, there's this need. It just points about, out the need for affirmation. Somebody's saying, hey, look at me. I want you to tell me how beautiful I am, how strong I am, how handsome I am, how lovely I am. And, and I, I, just, I, I just want you to know who you are in Christ, that you don't have to fight for the affirmation of others. In fact, let me tell you something before we b- begin that, that is going to shock you. It is so, it is, we are so steeped in it in this culture that, that I, I'm going to give you a stat that I just came across this past week. Um, I, I was actually watching a, a documentary on tourism around the world and how tourism affects um, other, other countries, other, um, not only the countries themselves, but even the landscapes or or the, um, uh, the tourist, uh, how do I say it, the, the tourist traps, or the things that you go see that, that tourism actually, you have these incredible, these incredible things, historical items, or beautiful landscapes, or gorgeous beaches, and then somebody discovers it, all these people flood to it, and they end up trashing it. They end up uh, and so, so for instance, uh, uh, my wife and I, we've, we've gone through, we've pretty much been through every uh, country in Central America and, 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 and lots of other countries around the world. And if you go to Central America, let's say that you go to the Mayan ruins. If you go to the Mayan ruins, which we've been to, people are just walking all over everything. And, and it's fun. There's something inside of you that says, this is really neat. But over the course of time, those, those artifacts or those monuments or uh, the, you know, the temples that the Mayans built, they're going to get ruined over the course of time because tourism just does that. So I just thought, well, this is so interesting, you know, watching this, how this one guy in, somewhere in Thailand or Cambodia went to this undiscovered beach, discovered it, he filmed it, he shared it with a few friends, and all of a sudden, word got out, and, and, and then uh, people by the tens of thousands started making their way to this, to this beach that was pristine and it was preserved and all of a sudden just after a few years it gets trashed absolutely trashed where it's no longer pristine because of tourism well in this in this uh, documentary that i was just i was just so interested in and i'm I'm just kind of built that way i just like that type of stuff and they said this statistic that was shocking to me i never thought it was i i I just couldn't imagine it but yet it, it shows you how steeped this is in our culture in that they interviewed people and they said, they said, if you were not allowed to post a picture of you 
in, in, in front of this monument or on this Mayan ruins or at this beach, if you, if you could not post pictures of you at that tourist destination on Instagram, would you go? If, if you could not show people where you've been, you couldn't take any pictures and post it. You could take pictures, you just couldn't post it on Instagram. If, if, you, were, if you were locked out of Instagram, would you still go? 29% said, no, I would not travel if I could not post it on Instagram. And I thought to myself, how heartbreaking is that? Because the, 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 the historical destination, destination or that pristine location wasn't as important as the affirmation that they get from people on social media saying, wow, I can't believe you got to see that. The, that 30% of the time, almost 30% of the time, the affirmation was far more important than the adventure. How many know if you're living your life like that, you're not going to enjoy life? Because it wasn't about the, the adventure, it wasn't about the journey, it was about the affirmation. And if you base your life on affirmation from others, can I tell you, you will not enjoy life like you're meant to enjoy life. And I want you to listen today. This is how, this is how important it is. That if you live your life based upon the affirmation of others and then don't receive it, you're going to be deeply wounded. Oh, why, why, aren't they, why aren't they telling me how lovely I am and how beautiful I am and how handsome I am or how awesome I am? Why, aren't they, why are they not saying those things? And you're going to be wounded when somebody doesn't respond. And even more so, if you live your life for affirmation from others and they actually do the opposite, they end up critiquing you, you're not only going to be deeply wounded, you're going to be deeply offended. How dare they do that? How dare they talk to me like that? How many know that there's some employees in our nation today that need to be critiqued a little bit? How many know what I'm talking about? You know it's true because you know when you're, when you're in the grocery store or you're at a restaurant, you're, you're like some boss needs to take care of this, some manager needs to take care of this. Anytime I go into a, a restaurant, and, and you walk into a, a, a restaurant and you see that, you, you know, the, the room is dirty, the bathrooms are dirty, the, the, all of the workers are just walking as slow as they can because they don't care about you. I, I always think that has nothing to do with all of the employee, employees. It has everything to do with the manager. I think it's just bad management. That if you're a good manager, you're not going to allow those things to happen. You're not going to allow uncleanliness. You're not going to allow... Uh, um, you, know, you know, lack of motivation or just slow. You're going you're gonna to keep other people hopping and moving and things are going to be clean and things are going to be ran tight. And so it, it, it's so interesting that it annoys you when you go into a business when, when everything is not a tight running ship and you think to yourself, boy, somebody needs to tell these employees, they, they, hey, move it, move it, come on, work faster. Hey, walk faster. Hey, do this better. Hey, this is unclean. And yet when we receive that critique ourselves, it drives us nuts. Because you know it should happen in, others peop in other people's lives. You just don't think it should happen in your life. Okay, I'm going to just drop this mic right here. <laughs> no, <I'm> just <laughs> but you know it's true, don't you? But you know it's true. Because if you live your life for the affirmation of others and don't receive it, you're going to be deeply wounded. Or if they dare criticize you... Even if they're right, you're going to be deeply offended. Can I tell you, living your life for the affirmation of others will steal the joy that God means and desires for you to live in. And you need some soul relief today. And I'm here to help you. Because you're not meant to live life like that. You're not meant to live life based on the affirmation of others. Because the creator of the universe takes great joy in you as his child. And he loves you. And I want you to live your life enjoying his affirmation. We said this at the start of the series, that when you learn to enjoy Christ, you'll learn to enjoy life. When you start enjoying Christ, you'll start enjoying life. And part of enjoying Christ 
You have to know what he thinks about you. And he thinks some things about you that might shock you. And I'm going to show it to you today. Get ready for some encouragement. We're going to, we're going to look at the life of David. And if you study the life of David, David, of course, became king, but he wasn't always king. And so I'm going to teach you some things about David. And I'm going to show you that affirmation is extremely important to God. The problem is I don't think we're listening to God's affirmation or we don't know his word well enough to know that he is affirming us all the time and he will affirm you through his word. So we're going to look at the life of David. David was born uh, from the tribe of Judah. He was the great-grandson of Ruth and Boaz. If that puts that in context, if you study your Bible, he's the great-grandson of Ruth and Boaz. He was the youngest of eight sons. And I'm going to break in here for all of you who just love to study the Bible and and you love to go deeper in the word of God. And I hope that's all of us. Uh, but the, the Bible says a couple of things about the, the siblings of David. First of all, it records that David had at least two sisters. He might, may have had more. But two, two sisters' names are actually recorded and given out. And then in two different portions of Scripture, one in 1 Samuel and the other one's in, in 1 Chronicles, that one says that David was the youngest of eight brothers, so he had seven siblings, all of which were older than him. But then you look at the, 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 um, um, the genealogy records of David and his family, and it doesn't show seven brothers, it only shows six, that he's the youngest of seven brothers. And a lot of people say, how is that? Why, why does that happen? And let me, tell you, let me teach you something about, uh, we could say the chronicles or the genealogies of, of people in the Bible in that. If it, this happens all the time, it happened all the time back then, we have record on it in numerous places, numerous ways, that if, if, a, if a son was born and that son died as a child or died as, as a young adult and produced no children, that that son would be left out of the genealogy. He would be left off of record. And so in 1 Samuel, we have a l list of all of the brothers of David, that there are seven brothers, but then First Chronicles, which was written later than First Samuel, at some point we really believe that a brother must have died because that record of that brother isn't in the list found in First Chronicles. Does that make sense? So sometimes they would just leave out a, a, a sibling or a child if that child was young or if that child was even older and never had any children. Uh, and I hate to say this, but sometimes if he didn't have any boys, if he just had girls, they would leave out that genealogical record as well. How many are grateful we don't live in that time period that, that things have, have changed? Praise God for that. So David was the youngest of eight sons, and he, of course he had at least two sisters, so large family. He was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is about five to six miles away from Jerusalem. So um, uh, when Samuel comes to see him, and, and then in a, in a little while we'll see that Saul actually calls um, uh, David to come up to, to the palace that it's about a five to six mile walk. And, and I've been there before in Bethlehem, between Bethlehem and Jerusalem. There are just some rolling hills. You could easily make it there uh, well within a couple of hours. Uh, you, could, you could travel from Bethlehem to uh, Jerusalem. So David was a shepherd, as you know. We're going to read that in a second. But he was also a musician. He was also a musician. And I'm going to tie a couple of things together just to, just to give you some things to think about and just to say, well, that's neat. I didn't know that. That, that the Bible records uh, something about Saul and about David at two different times that point to the same moment in time. And what it is, when David is anointed, what we're going to read here in a second, David is, is anointed by Samuel as king. And the Bible says at that very moment that, um, that God literally just pulled his hand from Saul, who was king at the time. He just pulled his hand from uh, from Saul, or you could say it like this. I think the Bible records it this way, that the spirit of the Lord left Saul and an evil spirit began to torment him. And while this was happening, the, the advisors of, of Saul said, hey, why don't we call for somebody to come and minister in song to you? Like, why don't we call a musician because music will help soothe you? And so he, he said, well, who's, who's really, really good at, at being a, a musician? Well, there was a guitar player he was a shepherd out in the fields of Bethlehem, and he was known to be a great musician, and it was David. And so he calls David, and David ends up going to the palace and playing his, his lyre, playing his stringed instrument, 
The closest thing that we would have to it today is, is a guitar. He, he played that for Saul. And every time that Saul heard this music being played under the anointing of David, who was also the psalmist, the Bible says that Saul would be just supernaturally soothed. Can, can I tell you, music is very effective. That's why we tell you, when it comes to your worship and prayer time, I think it's great if you just play some instrumental worship during your prayer time or during your study time, uh, just as you worship the Lord. Can I tell you, that, that's highly beneficial. God created you. God created you to enjoy music. Did you know that? I'll teach on that at another time. Uh, so David was called to be not only a shepherd and not only a mu musician and not only a giant slayer and not only a great warrior, but he was called to be king. Let's start reading in first chapter, uh, first Samuel chapter 16 is where we're going to start verse one. Here we go. It's in your notes. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king over Israel? Now, Saul was obviously still king, but there's a transition that's about to take place. He says, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. So he, what he's saying is, how can I go and do that if I'm taking some oil and I'm going to anoint somebody king? Well, Saul's going to take off my head. He doesn't want to give up his kingship. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. So Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him because he was a man of authority. They asked, do you come in peace? And Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. And then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. Everybody, don't live your life being impressed by the looks of others. I could bring up some names here, but I won't. I'm going to say this. Some of the greatest people that I know, some of the mightiest men and women I know, are, not, are certainly not the best-looking people in the world, but they are heroes in the faith. They're heroes in the faith, people who have given up their lives for the sake of the gospel, and they might not look beautiful on the outside, but they are certainly beautiful on the inside. So don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I want to break in here for a second and just tell you something that's great parenting. And, and, and even as grandparents, you, can, you, you need to steal this, and probably most of you know it. But can I tell you, we live in a generation that, that lives for affirmation based upon the outward appearance. And we need to teach our children and our grandchildren that when it comes to finding a spouse, yes, you need to be attracted to that person, but beauty is fleeting. Outward beauty is fleeting, the Bible says. It doesn't stay forever. That you need to find a person who's not just attractive on the outside, but they are beautiful on the inside. Can I tell you that, that okay, so I, I have two, two sons uh, who are in Bible college right now, and my wife and I, we've trained them. Hey, listen, it's not just about the outside. You need to find someone who's beautiful on the inside. We've just drilled that into our, our boys. Now, our, our daughters, Grace and Delight, uh, they're, they're not going to get married until they're 35, so we have a little while to teach them that. But our boys, we want some grandchildren, everybody, pretty quickly. We're like, ask somebody out. Come on, you know? But, but it's true. We need to teach our children. We need to treat... To, to teach our children where beauty really is, that it really is on the inside. And yes, the, I, I think there should be a physical attraction between husband and wife. I really do think that. But there has to be beauty on the inside. And if you base your decision just on outward appearance, can I tell you, that's not the heart of God. 
He doesn't base his judgments on the outside, but God always looks at the heart. He always looks at the heart. Verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel, but Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all of the sons that you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Like, surely you don't want him. He's just a shepherd. And if I call him in today, he's going to look bad, and he's going to smell bad, and he's not going to represent the family very well. And watch what, watch what Samuel says. He says, sin for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. What he was saying was, He's worth the wait. And can I tell you something? If you're single in this room, you are worth the wait. You are worth the wait. You don't have to rush into a relationship in order to get affirmation from somebody that you need to know who you are in Christ Jesus and you need to be so confident as a special child of God, a wonderful child of God, that you know in your heart, I am worth the wait. I am worth the wait. Like, I I will wait for the right person that God sends me. By the way, when he sends me the right person, they're going to be worth the wait too. You need to be confident in who you are. So he sent for him and had him brought in, bad looks and bad smell and all, and he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise, rise. And anoint him, this is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And then Samuel left and went to Ramah. So we had this incredible moment in the life of David in which he he was affirmed by God. Could you imagine? Could you imagine all of your brothers, your seven brothers standing there and they're handsome too, and yet they're bigger and they're stronger and they're not stinking because they're out, they've been out in the field and then they're not dirty like they've been out in the field. They're representing the family much better. And, 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 and the man of authority walks in and he says, you know what, those are great guys, but I'm looking at you because God has actually chosen you. You're the one. The shock that he must have felt in his life. And you think, well, that's, that's David. That's, that's not me. Okay. I'm going to prove you wrong this morning because God has chosen you. You have been chosen by God, and God says that he shows no favoritism whatsoever. So you can think of the greatest man or woman of God that you believe has ever lived or is even living right now. And I'm telling you something. You are just as special, just as called as they are. Because God shows no favoritism. And you've been looking, you've been looking for affirmation from others. And I want you to know... And I want you to experience the affirmation of God. No doubt you know what it's like to be wounded. You know what it's like when no one affirms you. I was thinking this, and I, I, this, is, this happened so long ago that the statute of limitations is off now. So I'm going I'm to say this, because this happened years and years and years ago. In fact, uh, I don't know that anybody's on staff now that was on staff during this time except for me and Pastor Lowell. Uh, everything has just changed. That's how long ago this was. And, and one of the worst, one of the, the, the most hurtful um, uh, days in ministry, and this, this is, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not looking for attention for that. I'm just being honest with you that we all deal with it. One of the most hurtful days in ministry that we ever had was actually Pastor Appreciation Sunday. You're like, well, Pastor, how in the world could that happen? 
Well, way back then, again, this is well more than a decade ago. This is a long time ago. Somebody who doesn't attend church, if they did, I wouldn't be saying this right now, okay? So somebody that doesn't attend church here, they stood up and they, it was their job to kind of affirm the, uh, to, to affirm the pastors and say, hey, this is why we appreciate our pastors. And, and this person just went kind of one by one. And instead of saying, oh, we love the so-and-so because they, and we love so-and-so because they, he actually ripped the, the he actually just ripped the staff apart like just was sarcastic about every one of us. And, and he said something ab- about me that, that I thought, what, what, what? That wasn't even funny. And where did he get that? And he said, oh, and we all know about Pastor Justin. He always says that there's something about a 10,000, or you know, he always says there's something about a $1,000 seed. I was like, I've never said that in my life. And, and I know what he was doing. I think he was comparing me to a televangelist. And I'm like, I don't even like it when televangelists say it. And I would never say that. And if you know us, we don't take any offerings. I never talk about that stuff. We have to give generously from the heart. And I know that. And I, so if you've ever noticed, we don't put any pressure on people with giving or tithes and offerings. And we don't manipulate that. It just is what it is. And if you want to give, you can join us. And, and I, was, I was rather offended. I thought on the day that you're supposed to be appreciating me is the day that you throw me under the bus. And make me look foolish. Well, I just, I just took the hit. I said, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to you know, pretend as if it doesn't happen. I'm not going to let that have any effect on my life. And Pastor Lowell comes in the next day, and he was just in tears. He said, what was that? I said, brother, I don't know. He said, he said I got to tell you, Pastor Justin, I was hurt. I, I was wounded. And I said, Lord, let, let me tell you something that the Lord just spoke to me last night when I was dealing with this with the Lord. That I can either live, now listen, new song, listen. I can either live for the applause of man or I could live for the applause of God. And I choose to live for the applause of God because God's applause on my life is eternal. Yours is only temporary. Temporary. And I don't mean that bad. I just mean that God's reward for the life that I live, that is an eternal reward. Your reward to me is just temporary. And I told him, I said, we don't live for for man's applause. We live for the applause of God. Well, we're both just, you know, crying messes and we hug it out and we just encourage ourselves, everybody. And, you know, Pastor Lowell and I still look back at that day, one of the most memorable days, one one of the most memorable days and one of the most healing days of our lives happened in that moment. And I'm telling you, if you live your life for the affirmation of others and they don't give it, you'll be deeply wounded. Or if they do the opposite and actually critique you, you'll be deeply offended. And I'm telling you, it will steal the joy from your life. And I've just chosen to live for the applause of God. And I know who I am in Christ Jesus. And I know the calling that I have upon my life. And I'm secure in it. I'm confident in it. It doesn't mean I'm prideful. In fact, I know it's the grace of God upon my life. It's the mercy of God upon my life. But I also know that I am special to him. And I want to teach us a few things that I hope are going to minister to you today. That first of all, you need to know this. We read this in scripture. I'm going to say it this way, that God knows things about you and about me. God knows things about you that you don't know. He knows things about me that I don't know. That there was something in David as he was out in the field, as he was playing his lyre, as he was being a psalmist, as he was singing and writing and and taking care of the sheep, that God saw something in David that he did not see in in himself. And I'm telling you, there is something in you that you don't see. That God has placed things in you that you might not see, but they are in you. The Bible says that we have been given this ember, this, this, um, th- this uh, 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 ember inside of us that is to be stirred up, or the Bible says it this way, to fan in the flames the gifts that you have been given. I placed something in you. Uh, let me say it this way. New song, you have a seed of greatness inside of you, and you're to fan that into flames. You are to stir that up because it's in you and it's in me. By the grace of God, it's in us. There is something about you that you don't know, that God knows things about you that you don't know, that you have greatness in you that you haven't seen yet. 
And as you follow after Christ and as you live your life as a passionately devoted follower of Christ, all of a sudden those things are going to be start coming out of you and you're going to start producing a harvest and you're going to start seeing the fruit of the Spirit in your life, but also the fruit of your ministry is going to be seen not only by you but by others. There's greatness in you. There's greatness in you because God planted it there. It wasn't, think about this, it wasn't placed there by human hands. And it cannot be removed by human hands. It was placed in you by your heavenly Father, the creator of the universe, put gifts in you because you have a purpose on your life, a calling on your life. You are special to him. You have greatness in you. See, God sees something in you that you don't see in yourself. It's a calling. It's a purpose. It's greatness. Second thing, this is going to be hard for some of you to believe that as his child, my heavenly father, he delights in me. And as his child, your heavenly father delights in you. Well, pastor, that's, that's, that's impossible. Because God knows me. And since God knows me, there's no way that he can possibly delight in me because I still sin. I still say bad words. I still have bad thoughts sometimes. Sometimes I do bad things. Like surely God doesn't delight in me. And what you're doing is you think that God's love is based upon your actions. And God's love is not based upon your actions because he says, while you were still sinners, Christ died for you. He loved you so much that even in your sin, he gives his life for you. Why? Because you're special to him. Because he loves you. He, he doesn't love you for what you do. He loves you for who you are. I'm going to say it again. He doesn't love you for what you do. Because you can try to perform for him all day long, but not be in a relationship with him. And he says, you know, I would rather you be in relationship than to have, your perform than to have performance in your life. See, he doesn't love you for what you do. He just loves you for who you are. Let me prove it to you in Scripture. This is what Psalm 149 verse 4 says. The Lord delights in his people. And you know what that word delights mean means? It means he delights in you. Like you, you, you light up his life. Let's go old school song right there. Don't make me sing it. I will. I'm not. That when God thinks of you as his child, when he thinks of you, he has a smile on his face. He delights in you. He crowns the humble, the Bible says, with victory. He delights in you. Zephaniah 3.17, one, one of the greatest verses in the Bible. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love, and he will exult over you with loud singing. And in the original text, and some of you might know this, that when God thinks of his children, the Bible says he rejoices over us with singing. And the, the idea there is that he's spinning and dancing and singing about his children. What does the voice of God sound like? Oh, greater than anything we've ever listened to. Did you know that God sings about you? As his child, he sings about you. He delights in you. Well, pastor, I, I do nothing but disappoint him. I, I do nothing but I, I think he's just constantly angry with me. C can I tell you something about that? If that's the way you feel, the, the Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren, meaning he, 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 he accuses Christians and reminds them of their failures and their faults and their sins. And if you focus on those things, you're going to live a miserable life. Stop focusing on your badness and focus on his goodness. And when you focus on his goodness, it's easier for you to leave your badness behind. But if you focus on your badness, you're just going to keep getting bad. You're going to keep being bad. 
So you focus on his goodness. You put your your you point your 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 attention towards the object of your faith, Jesus Christ. You keep your focus on the author and finisher of your faith, the Bible says. Some of you are so focused on your badness that you're failing to focus on his goodness. And it's in his grace and his mercy that he saves us. And it's in his grace and his mercy that he delights in us. And it's in his grace and his mercy that he calls us out of a life that we don't enjoy to one that we are meant to enjoy to the fullest. That's what he's calling us to. And I say, let's move forward in him. Let's move forward in Christ Jesus. Let's delight ourselves in the fact that he delights in us. It it, it takes us to number three. Write this down. That the lies that I believe affect the life that I live. So if you believe the lies of the enemy, if you believe that you are worthless, if you, if you believe that you're saved, but only saved by the skin of your teeth, and that before you get to heaven, God's going to give you a big old spank and a big old uh, 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 bop upside the head and say, okay, well, you barely made it in, son. You barely made it in, daughter. Come on in. But boy, I'm going to spank you first. Can I tell you, if that's your mindset, you're not going to enjoy life. And that's a lie from the enemy that says that God is out to get you when in reality, God's not out to get you. He's out to get you. And there's a difference. He's out to call you in, to embrace you, to love you, to care for you, to be in relationship with you. He wants to share all of himself with all of you. He wants to pour himself in you. Sometimes... We believe the lies of the enemy, and we believe we're worthless, and we believe we're not worth saving. We, we believe that God doesn't love us, or if he does, he's just barely, barely enough to get into heaven. And you're believing it because the devil is accusing you of the sin that God has forgiven you of. He's accusing you. He's bringing up the past hoping that you'll live in it. But you're not supposed to live in your past. Your past is just that. It's just the past. It is what it is. It cannot be changed. But as we say here often, your past does not define your future. That your future is not your past unless you make it that way. You don't have to live out what you've been living out. You can experience some soul relief. Stop believing the lies. And I'm going to teach you how in a second. I'm going to teach you a fourth thing very quickly. That I refuse to be defined by my feelings. I refuse to be defined by my failures. And I refuse to be defined by the familiar. Let me break that down to you. I refuse to be defined by my feelings. That, that I have these feelings, but if they are not in alignment with the word of God, then I make sure that those feelings do not control my life. I may feel a certain way, but just because I feel that, just because that emotion is real, we say this all the time in counseling, at least I do, that your emotions may be real, but that doesn't mean they're valid. Your emotions may be real, but it doesn't mean they're valid. So you might have some very real feelings and very real emotions, but if they are not in alignment with the word of God, then they are not valid. And you cannot be defined by your feelings unless you let your feelings define who you are. So sometimes I feel bad. Sometimes I have a bad day. I just move forward in faith and I just know, hey, that's not in alignment with the word of God. I'm taking that thought captive. I'm making it submissive to Christ. I'm gonna live a life of faith that God has called me to. I reject that lifestyle. I'm going to live a life of joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. That's how I'm going to live my life. And I just make a conscious effort. That's how I'm going to do it. This is how I'm going to live my life. I'm teaching you guys how to live by faith, how to enjoy life. And if you live life according to your feelings, your feelings will control you. 
I tell my children this all the time. You've heard me say it too. If you don't control your emotions, your emotions will control you. And that's the truth. If you don't control your emotions, your emotions will control you. So I'm not defined by my feelings. I'm not defined by my failures. That my failures do not determine my future. That my failures are in the past. My failures, listen to this, everybody. My failures are not in the future unless I choose them to be in the future. And I don't want them there. So I'm choosing to leave my past exactly where it belongs in the past. I will not be defined by my failures or my feelings. And I will not be defined by the familiar. Meaning, well, it's just always been this way. It's just always been this way. This is how it's been in my family for generations. It's just this way. Hey, listen, that thought does not define who I am. I don't care if it's been in my family. It's not in my family. I don't care if it's been in my past. It's not in my present. I've just chosen to live life like that. I, there's just some things in my family that I've just broken. In fact, I'm so grateful that my, my father broke some things that were passed from generation to generation to generation in our family, including alcoholism. And my dad just broke that in, in our family. He just broke it. And there, there's some things that, that no doubt the devil wants to put on you and wants to put on your family, put on your children. And somebody has to stand up and say, listen, I will not be defined by the familiar. Just because it's always been like that doesn't mean it's going to be like that from here on out. That is not who we are. We are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves you, and he delights in you. He rejoices over you with singing. And if you live your life for the affirmation of others... You're going to live a miserable life. You'll either be deeply wounded or deeply offended or both. And that's a terrible way to live life. Don't do it. I'm talking today about soul relief. Soul relief. Don't live your life like that. Don't live your life according to what the world or others say you are. You live your life according to who God says you are and you are his child, you've been chosen. You belong to him. He loves you, and he thinks you're beautiful. I've said this before, and I'm gonna say it again, even though there have been a couple of, there have been some people at our church that when I say this, they leave the church. They're so legalistic, they can't get their mind, they can't get their mind around this. That if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. Do you know how many people have been offended by that? Uh, he wouldn't have their picture. You know what? I don't know what to tell you. You don't know the love of God. You don't know the grace of God. You don't know the mercy of God. If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it because he loves you. He delights in you. You're his child. You belong to him. I'm about to speak something over you here in just the next couple of moments. Every single thing that I'm going to say is a quote from the Word of God. It, they are not my words. These are the words of your Heavenly Father. And I want you to receive it as that today. This is just direct out of the Bible what God thinks about you. Would you stand up with me? The Lord told me very specifically how to close this moment. And I'm going to speak some things over your life today. And as I'm speaking these things, if I hit an area, if I hit a topic that you struggle with, I'm going to do nothing but speak truth into your life. And I want you today just say in your heart, Father, I receive that. What I'm, what I'm saying is this. Today, I want you to take possession of what God already believes about you, what God already knows about you. I want you to take a possession of what you own as a child of the Most High God. Because when he's saying these things in his word, he's saying them about you and he's saying them about me. So today we're going to live by faith. We're not going to call God a liar because he's not. And when we hear these words, we're going to say, Father, thank you. I receive that today in the name of Jesus because I'm a child of God.
that promise belongs to me, that word belongs to me. Your thoughts about your children, that belongs to me because I'm your child. If you're not a child of God, we're gonna solve that problem right here, right now. And if you give your life to Jesus, I'm gonna ask you to go by guest services in just a few minutes. You can pick up this book called Fresh Start. Just let them know, hey, I gave my life to Jesus today. And they're just gonna simply get some information from you and give you this book, it's free. So we're gonna start it with this. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I repent of my sins. And today I've heard about your love for me and I've heard about the gift of your son, Jesus. Today I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't wanna run from you. I certainly don't wanna rebel against you. In fact, I want to run to you. So today I do. And according to your word, everybody who calls upon you, everybody who runs to you, they make it. Everybody who calls upon you, they're saved. And I say, thank you for saving me. Today, I, I make you Lord of my life, Jesus. You're Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. And if you prayed that prayer in this moment or you've prayed at any time in the past, you are a child of God. So therefore, what I'm about to speak, these promises, these words of truth, they belong to you. And I want us all to open up our hands toward heaven and just in your heart as I read these out, just in your heart, just say, Father, I receive this. I take it by faith. Today I possess who I am in Christ. I possess the things that you told me are mine in Christ Jesus. I take possession of them. Today I own them, not because of my works, but because of your goodness and your grace and your mercy in my life. I believe your word over mine. And here they are. New song. In him, we have been chosen according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. New song, we have been included in Christ. We are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. We are God's special possession to the praise of his glory. And as God's creation and as God's chosen, we are holy and dearly loved, and the peace of Christ rules in our hearts since we are members of his body. All of that creates in us grateful and thankful hearts. In God's great mercy, he gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and into an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. New song, through faith, we are supernaturally shielded by God's power. We belong to a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, and we are called to, to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Come on, just say that in your heart. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I have a purpose and a calling upon my life. And say this, God is always with me. So I am strong and full of courage. My strength comes from my Father, and he is my defender. Through his Spirit, I walk in power, and I walk in love, and I walk in self-control. My Father renews my strength. He is for me. He is not against me. He is doing a good work in me. My feelings and my failures have no control over me. His power is actually made perfect in my weakness, so I can and I will walk in confidence confidence. I am special to God, and I am blessed beyond measure, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life, because I am, by his grace and by his mercy, a child of the Most High God. He has adopted me and accepted me into his family, and he believes, and he knows that I am special. I am his possession. I am beautiful in his eyes, and he delights in me. And now, Father, that being said, we delight in you. And we say thank you for choosing us. Thank you for taking us as your own. Thank you for adopting us into your family. Do you get all of the praise, all of the glory, both now and forevermore? And from this day forward, we will walk in our God-given identity, we will walk as children of God, dearly loved, 
beautifully accepted, miraculously forgiven. Thank you for saving us, for adopting us, and for calling us out of the lies of this world and this culture and into the truth of your dear son. Thank you. You get all of the praise, all of the glory in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say a big amen. Let's give, some, let's give the Lord some praise this morning. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You are, you are so very precious to the Lord. You are so very precious to the Lord. You are beautiful. You are strong. You are chosen. You belong to the Father. Now live like it. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. I love you.